Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, uh, introduce to you a, a fellow that uh, I've known for many, many years and his wife. Uh, so it was great that uh, he was willing to come here and talk to our group about a very interesting topic, I believe. So let me tell you a little bit about him. This is Greg Rakloski. And um, Greg uh, re uh, received his BS and MS degrees in electrical engineering from Rensselaer Polytech Institute. After that, he went to work for Bell Labs in Whippany, New Jersey. And he worked there for 25 years. Um, while working for Bell Labs, he also studied uh, to uh, obtain his private uh, flying uh, license. And he obtained that in 1990, went on to get his uh, instrument rating at 1992 and commercial pilot license in 1994. So maybe we can get him to fly us somewhere if we wanna go on some trip somewhere. Sounds like we have some pretty interesting trips coming up. Um, now recently, uh, Greg even took a past a recertification test in his current plane, and he'll tell you more about that plane and the others that he's had in the past. So Greg and his wife, Pam, have passed uh, a private, uh, have based a private plane at Marstown Airport since 1991. So they've been flying for quite a long time. Since that time, they've owned four planes of progressive uh, complicated complex complicity and sophistication. And again, he'll tell you more about that uh, as he gives his talk. Uh, Greg's uh, talk is the Marstown Airport, a pilot's view of its history, growth, and status today. Um, this should be interesting uh, for especially you history buffs, that the history of that area. And also, um, are there any pilots in this group Nobody. Uh, okay, and Herb Waddell, you might want to speak with uh, Greg uh, with, uh, as your alma maters, the two alma maters. So a little bit difference in time a bit, but still <laughs> alma maters. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce and please welcome uh, Greg Rakloski. <laughs> Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Greg Raklowski. Um I am uh, give you a little bit more background on me uh, myself than uh, Mano had provided. Um, as he said, I'm an electrical engineer, and uh, I got my master's and BS degree from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Um, uh, I worked at Bell Labs in Whippany for 27 years. Um, before that, I actually worked also at uh, Lockheed Electronics and uh, after that at RCA Astro Electronics. Um, at RCA, um, they were both, um, uh, RCA uh, Astro Electronics, we built uh, satellites there. It was outside of Princeton and uh, Heightstown, New Jersey. We built satellites there and I worked mainly on uh, weather satellites uh, for both the NOAA and the um, Air Force. Um, after that, I went to Bell Labs. I spent most of my career there. I worked, uh, since I had a secret security clearance, my first job at Bell Labs was the gov with government systems. Uh, most of the work we did there was uh, ASW, anti-submarine warfare uh, stuff. Um, and uh, back in the 90s, uh, well, with the fall of the Soviet Union in 89, 90, um, the Soviet threat for submarines kind of went away and um, uh, most of that work dried up. So I moved over into the cellular base station design. That was a big field that was ramping up rapidly in the 90s. So it was good. But then one of the most important things is um, how I got started in flying. Uh, Bell Labs had lots of clubs back then. And uh, one of them was called this Bell Labs Adventure Flying Club. And um, I found out about it and uh, it sounded pretty interesting. And we take trips, um, we go to dinner to Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket uh, one evening, or we would uh, go for a weekend down to the Outer Banks or a uh, long weekend up in Nova Scotia. 
And I realized, wow, this is uh, pretty cool. I can uh, can get around to unusual places very easily this way. And so um, uh, I started uh, flying lessons in, uh, at Lincoln Park Airport in 1990. Um, and um, I'll go into more details on that, but uh, I completed my private pilot's license there. I also have a commercial license and an instrument rating. Now the commercial license um, I got uh, after the instrument rating just to improve my level of competence. I'm flying my family around in this in an airplane, and I think I have to be as competent as I can be. So a commercial license increases your level of competency. Um, I bought my first airplane in the fall of 91, um, and I'll cover that in the f f following on slides. And I currently have about 3,900 hours of flying time all in uh, single engine aircraft. Now, let me give a little bit of history of the airport. Uh, it was started, the idea was, came about 1930s um, to, uh, and, and it, Morristown was a growing town and it felt they would have a need for an airport. And they got originally funding from the US government as a relief project. It was the middle of the depression and the government was trying to get put people to work. Um, Morristown owns the land that it's on, although it's kind of between Morristown and Florham Park in this shallow kind of uh, valley. And um, uh, they ran out of money pretty quickly. They got more money from the government in 1934. Um, there was some talk of it becoming a Zeppelin base because of the shallow valley it's in. It um, kind of led itself. It was kind of shielded from winds somewhat uh, between the hill that uh, Florham Park is in on one side and um, Morristown is on the other. But after the Hindenburg disaster, that kind of that idea kind of was put on hold. So um, they keep they they kept getting money from the government, and eventually uh, the airport was finished in 1943 um, as a in the, pretty much the form it's in now with two runways. But because of the World War II had started, uh, that probably hastened its completion because we needed to train lots of pilots for World War II. Um, and so it was taken over by the Army Air Force to become a training facility for pilots for World War II. We trained almost 500,000 pilots for World War II, which is an astounding number in such a short period of time. And this wasn't the case only in Morristown. There was lots of airports, dozens and dozens of airports across the country that were built and or expanded for World War II to train pilots. At the end of World War II, uh, ownership of the airport was transferred back, or I shouldn't say ownership, but operation of the airport was transferred back to Morristown, um, and uh, the Army Air Force moved out. Um, so uh, it went along, and in the 60s, the main runway, runway 523, which is the magnetic heading 05 and 23, and, um, was expanded from four to 6,000 feet. Um, that was to accommodate the rise of corporate jets, basically um, the Lockheed Jetstar and the, uh, the Learjet came out in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, and they needed longer runways than what was in a lot of places. They needed longer runways than a lot of the prop planes that were originally there. Uh, flight schools were added, um, corporate traffic increased, um, I remember reading somewhere in the late 80s or early 90s, Morris County had the most Fortune 500 companies based there. And, you know, Honeywell, uh, AT&T, BASF, Verizon, they were all tenants at uh, Morristown Airport for their own fleets of aircraft, uh, all jet aircraft. So and some pharmaceutical companies were there also, such as, you know, Merck and uh, uh, Sandoz and uh, uh, Pfizer. Um, unfortunately, Morristown was always losing money running the airport. So in 1981, they contracted out operation of the airport to DM Airports Limited. And um, they took over operation. And uh, as far as I know, they're making money there. And, um, uh, and they are paying Morristown 
for the lease of the land that they and Morristown is making money on the airport. Um, Morristown grew substantially during the 1970s. Uh, the reason for that was mainly that there was uh, the 70s were a boom time for general aviation aircraft. And I mean, small general aviation aircraft, you know, piston powered airplanes, you know, four seaters, six seaters, and so on. There was also some growth in in jet uh, corporate jet traffic, but the main driver then was uh, smaller aircraft. Um, in the late 70s, there was like 15,000 to 20,000 aircraft manufactured every year. I'm talking small general aviation aircraft. It was a huge number, and it only lasted for a few years. And um, today, that number is probably, is not probably, it's around 2,000 to 2,500 small general aviation, general aviation aircraft being manufactured. The reason for that was it was like a perfect storm of all these World War II veterans, um, Korean War veterans that were trained as pilots during those for those wars, and they all got into the age of well, I can afford my own airplane, and I like to, you know, reprise that whole idea of you know flying again. And it, you know, with five hundred thousand pilots just from World War II and a lot more from the follow-on wars. Uh, it drove the market and there was a lot of planes being bought and put in service and flying was more affordable then than now. Um, the cost of flying is not, not inexpensive. Um, and it certainly outstripped the rate, rate of inflation. At least in my time, it has. Um, so, um, I did my uh, private pilot training in what probably most people recognize as a Cessna, a Cessna 172. It's a you know all metal high wing airplane. Um, it's a it's a trainer. Uh, Piper made I'm sorry uh, Cessna made a smaller aircraft called a 152, but uh, those were so small and light that they got uh, more people or more flight schools bought the 172s for training. It's a um, fixed gear airplane, 160 horsepower. Um, it cruises about 110 knots. Um, and um, uh, I got my private pilot's license in that in, 19, uh, in the late 1990. It took me about 60 hours of flight time to get my private pilot's license, which is more than the FAA minimum. Yeah, but everybody progresses at a different rate. Uh, FAA requires 40 hours of flight time. Uh, but my instructor didn't feel I was ready to take the private pilot's exam until I had about 60 hours of flight time. And um, so after I got that, I realized, well, to fly, in order, in order to be able to fly reliably, you need to get an instrument rating because weather can get you stuck somewhere or you can get socked in somewhere and you can't get back home or you can't take your trip. You might have reservations somewhere and so on. So I started my instrument rating and I started in a 172 at Lincoln Park. And I realized that a 172 is not going to be the kind of airplane that's going to allow me to take my family on trips and so on and so forth. So I started looking around for another airplane and um, there was lots of airplanes that were manufactured in the 70s. Many manufacturers aren't there now, but I decided on a Rockwell Commander 114. Uh, Rockwell made airplanes back in the 70s, uh, small general aviation airplanes. Um, they also made the first Gulfstream One, and but they wanted to get out of the business. So um, they actually spun off their Gulfstream subsidiary, and that became the Gulfstream that we know now for making the large corporate jets. So the Rockwell uh, no, it was no longer in the airplane business, but I bought a 1977 Rockwell Commander. There was, you know, a fair number of them around since there were so many planes made in the 70s. It's a four-seat uh, retractable gear airplane at a 260 horsepower um, Lycoming engine, um, constant speed prop. Constant speed props uh, vary the pitch of the blades automatically to uh, make the airplane more efficient and give better takeoff and cruise performance. Um, and it, it got about 150 knot cruise speed. So it was quite a bit faster than 172. 
that's what it looks like uh, commander 114 um uh, one of the best features of it was uh it had uh trailing link landing gear which uh not many airplanes made in that time had and it made every landing that you made a you look like a hero because it was so smooth coming in when you dropped it onto the runway so um it was, a, it was oops um so it was a, a good starter airplane um so I decided to base it at Morristown. Um, and why Morristown? Well, uh, I knew I wanted to complete my um, instrument rating in that airplane because I'm going to be flying my family around in it and becoming, doing the instrument training, well, instrument, getting your instrument train, uh, instrument rating was much more difficult uh, than getting your private pilot's license. Um, instrument allows you just to fly strictly by reference to the instruments on your instrument panel with no visual clues for horizon or anything outside or uh so it, it's a uh, it's pretty intense and um if i got it in the airplane i was going to use for flying around i i figured i'll be the most competent and um so century flight academy was located at morristown airport um they're one of the best flight schools in any of the airports in the North Jersey area. Uh, they had a very good reputation uh, and they wanted to put my plane on leaseback. So a leaseback, um, basically uh, they rent the plane out uh, for training purposes. Now, a plane like the one Commander 114 was good for a commercial training because it, for commercial, to get your commercial license, you needed to have a high performance airplane that's over 200 horsepower uh, retractable gear and a constant speed propeller. So that met all the requirements, that uh, Commander 114 met all the requirements. Uh, and uh, so they, they would lease it out to students with the instructor. Um, and um, I had access to the plane when I needed it and I blocked it out and could use it for my own travels. Um, Morristown also had multiple runways uh, a long 6,000 foot main runway and a cross runway and um, uh, good ground services. Um, in wintertime, they they clean the airport up really quickly. Often they were open before Newark. Um, control tower. Um, so um, traffic was easier to manage, even though it was a busy airport. Um, if you wanted to pick up flight plans, you could do it through the tower uh, much more easily than in an uncontrolled field. And it had uh, good multiple instrument approaches to that airport. Um, there was also a good maintenance shop on the field. Uh, so if anything was amiss with the airplane, I could take care of it uh, on the spot and it would take in care, get, taken, get taken care of very quickly. They also had an avionics shop, so if any of the radios uh, went out, uh, they would uh, it could be taken care of quickly. Um, plenty of parking space. Um, as I mentioned before, it's a towered airport. There's about 46 public use airports in New Jersey, and only six of them have control towers. Besides, besides uh, uh, Morristown, Newark, of course, Atlantic City, Trenton, Teterboro, and uh, Caldwell or Essex County Airport, as it's actually known as. Um, and it was very convenient to my home and office. Uh, physically, Whippany campus I was at in Bell Labs was uh, five minutes away from the airport. And so, um, you know, I could go right after work or before work, even often I would go and take uh, some lessons for my instrument lessons and go to the office and be there, you know, at, at a reasonable time. Um, and I've, I've been a resident since then at Morristown, so it's a total of 32 years. Now, the uh, little tutorial on the air, Morristown, uh, well, airspace in general. Um, the uh, Morristown is 12 miles west northwest of Newark Airport, so um, there are several different types of airspace. Um, Morristown is Class D airspace, okay, uh, when the control tower is operative, and that's from 6.30 in the morning till, I'm sorry, 6.45 in the morning till 10.30 at night. Um, when the control tower is not operating, then it's 
reverts to uncontrolled or class E airspace. The green is class E. Class C is some uh, medium-sized airports like um, Albany, Hartford, so on. But Newark is class B airspace. So if you see, it, it looks like an upside down wedding cake. And so uh, it's located under the outer ring of the class B airspace. So you're under a lot of restrictions because of that. And um, I'll go into that in the next slide, but uh, this is a VFR terminal area chart or chart for the New York metropolitan area. Um, the outs, the, this is Newark, this is LaGuardia, this is JFK. Morristown is right here. Um, the outer ring here that you see is the outer ring of what I call the Class B airspace. And you can see Morristown is located underneath of it. Now, these numbers here, 70 over 30, that's the top of the uh, controlled airspace is 7,000 feet. The bottom is 3,000 feet. So the problem is, is that Class B airspace is positive control airspace. So if you want to go into that airspace, you need to get in touch with ATC. If you, you don't want to, uh, you could fly out of Morristown. Once you're outside their five mile ring that's controlled by the tower, you can you don't need to be having any kind of a flight plan unless you're IFR. Once you're on visual flight rules, you can just fly away, but you can't fly into this inside area of the, oh, I'm trying to get my cursor back. Uh, there it is. Okay, but you can't fly into this inside area because it's controlled class B airspace. But you can fly out to the west, to the southwest, and so on. So there are quite a few restrictions um, to, or, or quite a few things to look out for when you're flying in and out of Morristown, which adds a bit to the complexity of uh, being based there. This is a diagram of Morristown Airport. Uh, this is the main runway, 523. They also have a crosswind runway, which is nice because when it's when it's very windy and the wind's coming out of the northwest, you've got a direct crosswind on the main runway. And all airplanes have what they call a maximum demonstrated crosswind component, which you're not supposed to exceed. Um, it's something the manufacturer of the aircraft determines uh, when they get it certified. Um, so you have as an option, the crosswind runway here. And even if the wind's coming directly out of the north, um, you still have much of a less of a crosswind component and you can use either runway for that in those circumstances. What I wanted to concentrate on is this uh, uh, area here, which is the west tie down. That area is the area at Morristown Airport where most of the single small single engine aircraft are based. Um, the uh, most of the corporate jets are based in the other hangars over here in this part of the field. So uh, going back, I became a tenant in 1901 with the purchase of my first aircraft. I would put it on a lease back with Century Air and that uh, helped mitigate the cost of ownership. Uh, while I wasn't using it, the plane was being used for training purposes. Uh, it was being rented at a, for a good rate and it helped offset the fixed costs uh, like insurance and so on. Um, the plane was tied down at the air at the school's ramp area, which was uh, separate from uh, the rest of the uh, areas where the small general aviation aircraft were tied down. Um, I, I completed my instrument training in, uh, in it in 1992. So um, now I was instrument rated and uh, I could take I could take longer trips in it. And um, once I did that, I realized, wow, you know, uh, I needed a more capable airplane than the Commander 114. Um, so I started looking for another airplane and uh, I purchased what was, uh, I determined would be my next step up. It was a Piper Turbo Saratoga. So uh, it, this is a six seat aircraft. Um, and, um, it, um, uh, was turbocharged, so it had better altitude performance. 
um, the commander was normally aspirate had a normally aspirated engine so it uh, it lost power as you climbed so you really went above nine or ten thousand feet in it turbo saratoga was certified to twenty thousand feet uh had a 300 horsepower engine and most importantly it had full de-ice uh i realized uh after flying the commander around for a couple of years that you can get icing at altitude seven or eight months of the year even because it gets so much colder as you go up and uh so uh, I realized, uh, so that was the other thing I was looking for when I moved up to this aircraft. Um, so I uh, had to base the aircraft at the West Tie Down, uh, that area I indicated earlier, and it was too large to base at Century Air because of this wingspan. And I also put it on leaseback with Century Air. Uh, they, um, uh, they didn't use it for training, but they had a number of... Um, a number of pilots that completed instrument training um, and were looking for a faster, more capable airplane to take on business trips and so on uh, that they would pilot themselves. And uh, they kind of marketed it for me and it was on lease back with them. Um, and I, um, uh, it offset the cost of ownership. Um, now, back then, this was back in the early 90s, there was about 150 small piston powered aircraft located in Morristown, most of which were at the West Tie Down. Um, and during the 90s, that number started to go down. Now, this is what the Piper Saratoga looks like. It's a low wing airplane like the Commander. Um, uh, had a, uh, two doors, one for the pilot's side, uh, one for the pilot, and then a back door for the passengers in the back, had club seating in the back. It was pretty comfortable airplane. Um, so things started to evolve at Morristown. Um, back in the 90s, there was very little hangar space and some land was set aside and um, the airport built 40 small tea hangars at the West Tie Down. Um, they're primarily for tenants that were located there. I didn't move into one because um, there was a pretty hefty land lease. Uh, you didn't, you leased the land the hangar was on, you had to build the hangar on that land and you could get like a 10 year lease. And what happens after the 10 years, they, you know, you've got an investment in the hangar. Uh, what happens um, if the lease, they, they raise the rates of the lease to something ridiculous. Uh, I just didn't think it made economic sense to put my, you know, to go for that. So um, I didn't, I kept the plane and tied down outside. Uh, I didn't go into the, the uh, tea hangers. Um, a, they also put a second fixed base operator. Now a fixed base operator is basically a terminal for private aircraft. We call them FBOs, fixed based operators. Their main one at Morristown was a signature and they built another one over at uh, that one uh, signature is located close to the control tower. Uh, the second fixed base operator was located at the West Tie Down, and they were, you know, they were a little easier to deal with uh, since they were so close. If you needed fuel or whatever, um, they uh, and the, so they offered competition to Signature, so they weren't the only game in town. Um, the number of uh, uh, aircraft started decreasing at the West Tie Down. But corporate jet traffic was increasing uh, during the 90s, since that was becoming more of a thing with the co with corporations. And it became so much that uh, Morristown it started being referred to as Teterboro West. And Teterboro was notoriously um, busy with corporate aircraft. And uh, so uh, they, it, it became a thing for, to refer to Morristown as Teterboro West. So here's a, this, this is a few years old now, but uh, this is by year, it's hard to see, but it starts in 1946 and it ends at uh, 2018 or 2019 here. Um, the number of aircraft that are in service on the FAA registry. So there was a lot of aircraft built, small generation, right after World War II, but then that number 
dropped off. But then it picked up again in the 60s and the 70s. As I was mentioning, there was a huge number of aircraft built in the 70s. And many of those are still um, on the uh, on the FAA registry. Um, there was a few other peaks, but um, what happened was then in the... Um, um, sales dropped so much during the early 80s that uh, Cessna stopped making uh, small general, avi air, general aviation aircraft in 1986. That was the last year they made them for about 10 years. Uh, so Piper was also on the ropes. They were the two biggest manufacturers. Uh, so there was a huge drop in a number of deliveries and therefore a, a huge drop in a number of aircraft currently on the registry. So um, Piper uh, Piper eventually uh, reorganized and started making more aircraft after this dearth here in the in, in the 80s. And back in, in 1996, Cessna started making airplanes again, small general aviation airplanes. They always made jets, uh, the Citation line of jets. So that wasn't as affected, but the small general aviation aircraft were affected. So um, after flying the Saratoga around for I had I owned it for about eight or nine years. Um, I realized uh, for taking longer trips down to Florida, my my parents retired in Florida, my in-laws were in Florida. Um, I ha had a second home up in uh, Lake Placid, New York. Um, I uh, realized I need to move up to my third airplane. And so I uh, started looking around and I wanted to get something pressurized. So, um, a pressurized airplane, you can fly high and uh, not worry about using oxygen. I had an oxygen system in the Saratoga, and, and it was just a pain to use. Uh, uh, I had my kids were small still, and my, my daughter was fairly young. She couldn't, uh, she wouldn't want to wear a nasal cannula, stuff, stuff like that. So, so uh, uh, I went to a. Uh, uh, I decided to buy a 1987 Piper Malibu. So this is a six-seat aircraft, uh, but it was pressurized. Uh, it had a 350 horsepower turbocharged engine. So, uh, and it was quite a bit faster. It was about 50 knots faster than my Saratoga, and I could take it up to 25,000 feet. At 25,000 feet, you can get a, over the top of a lot of weather. Um, and or you can get around weather more easily that way. Um, the uh, the pressurization was uh, good enough to maintain an eight thousand foot cabin at uh, twenty five thousand feet. Um, and I was still decided to park it at the west tie down. Um, the problem became that the Malibu uh, had a forty three foot wingspan, and most of the T hangers that were built at Morristown were for aircraft with a 40 foot wingspan. So it wouldn't, there was only a handful of hangars that would fit in. Um, the other thing about this airplane, it's a relatively high performance aircraft. It's pressurized, um, more, much more complex systems. So um, the uh, insurance companies uh, basically are stipulating what you need to do for, uh, to get insurance. and um, the FAA requires like a BFR, a biannual flight review, every, once every two years. Um, the insurance companies are really dictating it. I have to go for your current training in the Malibu every year with a certified, uh, an insurance certified instructor um, that the insurance company recognizes. I can't go to any flight school or any CFI to get checked out in it. So and it's an all day affair. Basically, they review systems with you. You go up uh, for about three, three and a half hours of flying. You do a number of instrument approaches. You do a number of uh, envelope, edge of the envelope things like stalls and stuff in the airplane. So this is what a Piper Saratoga, uh, sorry, a Piper Malibu looks like. Um, it's got a it's. They call it a cabin class airplane because it's got a fairly roomy six place cabin with club seating in the back. Um, and uh, it's retractable gear, uh, just like uh, the uh, commander was in the, and the Saratoga.
Um, so moving on to what's happened at Morristown in the 2000s, um, well, we had 9-11, unfortunately, and uh, security increased tremendously. Uh, they required badges for all tenants of the airport. Uh, they installed electronic gates that only badge wearers could access restricted areas of the airport. Before that, it was kind of a, you know, it was pretty loosey-goosey. Um, the, the number of aircraft at the West Highland was still decreasing, and they consolidated some of the room and they made room for corporate hangars at the West High Down. But they were built, they were quite large hangars built mainly for large turboprop or jet aircraft. And uh, uh, the rent was re was exorbitantly high th to try to move my airplane in there. So I kept it at the West High Down. Um, yeah, there was a drop in traffic because, you know, now 20 years later, a lot of the people that bought airplanes in the 70s and based them there now are retiring or moving away or aging out of being able to keep flying for medical reasons or or other reasons. Um, and the uh, but corporate jet traffic kept increasing at Morristown. So it was still a, a fairly busy airport, but it started to go down. Um, and because of the reduction in the amount of tenants, um, uh, the uh, maintenance shop and the avionics shop moved off the airport because DM airports developers raised the rent of their rental space that they used for their business so high that they couldn't, you know, it didn't make sense for them to stay there anymore. Um, the prices of fuel and, and services increased uh, a lot more than um, uh, inflation, let's put it that way. Um, the only good thing for the residents around the airport is that the jet aircraft of the you know 90s and so on uh, were a lot quieter than the jet aircraft of the 60s and 70s. So the noise wasn't as bad, even though the planes were getting bigger. And uh, in 2008, the uh, uh, financial meltdown in 2008, 2009 really decreased traffic again tremendously. Um, here's a graph of uh, some of the uh, of the airport operations from 19 uh, uh, sorry from uh, 1990 on the left edge all the way to about 2022 here on the right edge and you could see it was pretty steady during the 90s then it started decreasing during the 2000s all the way down and it hit rock bottom around 2012 13 and then it bumped up again up here in, in the last two or three years it, the traffic has increased somewhat and i'll go over the reasons for that so, um, uh, again, prices and fuels went up. Uh, West Tie Down was shrinking again. And um, airport arrivals and departures started to increase in the 2010s, but not, it never recovered and still hasn't recovered to the level that it was at before the financial meltdown. I mean, if you look, it's pretty astounding. There was over 200,000 operations in the 1990s at the airport. Now it's about half that or less. And um, so what's an operation? That's any takeoff and landing. And that's for transient or local aircraft. So flight schools that are based there, anybody who does a touch and go, that's two operations. So the numbers may sound somewhat inflated when you think about 200,000 operations per year, but because it's a lot of things are counted in there that you may not think should be. Uh, there was also a commercial air carrier called the, the Ultimate Air Shuttle that was based there. Uh, they started flying there in about 2015. Um, um, they had a couple of flights from uh, Morristown to Chicago and Cincinnati, Ohio every day. It was just like a feeder airline. Um, and they had seasonal service, that means summertime only, to Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket when the demand is good. They were flying these aircraft called Dornier uh, 328s. They were a high wing jet aircraft 
that sat 30 people and um, um, they, um, they didn't, when you wanted to fly with them, you kind of had to join their club. Um, there was no TSA at Morristown Airport or screening like that. So they would vet you very thoroughly if you wanted to be. And, and so they really catered to the local flyers, uh, to uh, regular flyers uh, of that needed their services. And um, um, they, uh, they stopped service uh, to and from Morristown at the start of the pandemic, pretty much in 2020, when the uh, uh, amount of um, traffic w was so low and the, they just, just couldn't survive. And uh, they still have, I, to my knowledge, they're still in existence, but they don't offer any routes in, to and from Morristown. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about IFR. Um, uh, instrument flight rules, uh, you have to be on an IFR flight plan to, to fly under uh, instrument flight rules, which is when visibility is under three miles or ceilings are under a thousand feet above the airport elevation you're departing or landing at. Um, so unfortunately, being so close to Newark, uh, Newark of arrivals and departures are kind of uh, mixed in with departures in and out of Morristown. Um, so uh, it uh, made uh, it. So, so there are a lot of delays with instrument departures. Uh, you'd have to sometimes wait. I'd be waiting fifteen or twenty minutes for uh, after you know idling on the ground, waiting to get a, a, a clearance to take off from the tower. Um, anyway, uh, back into and going up to the 2020s, uh, Morristown Airport um, uh, flight activity increased a bit uh, because of the pandemic and flight school activity increased. Uh, that's mainly due to the fact that there's such a uh, shortage of commercial airline pilots, the flight schools, they are very busy cranking out pilots that want to move into the airlines. There's four flight schools at Morristown, American Flyers, uh, ATP, uh, Alpha Aviation, and Certified Flyers. Um, so even though a lot of longtime corporate um, tenants there are gone, such as AT&T, Honeywell, you know, Honeywell's corporate headquarters for North America used to be in uh, just up the up the road on Columbia Turnpike from Marstown, uh, they they're gone. Uh, Lucent Technologies, uh, they're gone now also. Um, and corporate flight departments at many companies were kind of viewed as a, an excess. So a lot of corporate flight departments were replaced by charter uh, use. Uh, the fractionals like. Um, uh, Citation shares, uh, net jets. Um, they were they used to be fractionals, and, and now the, most of them have gone charter. And so a lot of companies are using them for travel for their executives rather than uh, having the expense of their own flight department. So uh, re more recently, um, the uh, the FTC FBO, which was an independent uh, FBO, was purchased by Atlantic Aviation a national chain with higher fuel prices. Uh, the West Tie Down, again, shrank. now there's only about 45, 46 airplanes based there. There used to be 150, like I said. So th that's gone way down. Um, the, but the flight schools are doing well. Um, I noticed recently American Flyers just bought five new aircraft from Piper uh, for trainer, you know, specially built trainers. Um, they're based at the West Tie Down, and so is certified. Um, uh, there's a new carrier, JSX, that's going to start a service to and from uh, Morristown Airport. Uh, they fly uh, Embraer 145. They'll be flying Embraer 145 aircraft, which is a 44 seat um, twin engine jet um, built by Embraer of Brazil. Um, their initial uh, service will be only to Opelika in Florida, which is North Miami and Boca Raton. Um, 
the uh, 145 is a 44 seat airplane. So um, they'll have, I think right now they're planning on only like one daily flight to each of these locations. And I don't think that's even every day of the week. Anyway, um, so now uh, I, I owned the Piper Malibu for 21 years. I put over 2000 hours on it, um, well over 2000 hours. And I decided to uh, move up to something more capable last year. So in February of last year, I bought a Piper jet prop. So it's basically a PA-46 airframe, which is what my Piper Malibu was, but it's powered by a Pratt & Whitney turbine engine. It's got a 560 horsepower um, and it'll cruise at 255 to 260 knots at 26 or to 27,000 feet. Its ceiling is 27,000. That's what it's certified for. And again, like the Piper Malibu, it uh, requires annual recurrency training by a insurance approved training facility. Uh, unfortunately, still none of the flight schools at Morristown uh, qualify. So I have to travel somewhere to do the training. Um, I, I fly down to South Florida several times a year, and I generally schedule it on one of my trips to Florida. Um, there's a number of insurance certified training facilities there because the weather is good there most of the time. And um, that's, uh, yeah, I, I just take a day off and I do my recurrency training and I'm done for a year. Um, the one bad thing about it is that um, the turbine engine, um, turbine engines are efficient at high altitudes. The low altitudes are not very efficient. And so I find myself filing for much higher altitudes on trips than I did in the past uh, with my piston engine Malibu to take advantage of the increase in efficiency of the turbine engine. But that leads to some uh, conflicts with air traffic control. So, um, uh, the turbine also burns a lot more fuel than a piston engine, um, even making up for the fact that it's going a lot faster because drag increases the square of your speed. But um, Jet A fuel is a lot cheaper than Avgas, and you can get these discount cards, fuel cards, that give you even more of a discount. So the price of Jet A is so much less than Avgas that it kind of mitigates the increased fuel consumption. Um, but, um, so this is what a jet prop looks like. Um, basically firewall forward, it's, uh, well, from the firewall rear, it's an, a PA 46 or a Piper Malibu Mirage airframe, but firewall forward, it's, uh, totally different or totally been rebuilt. And it has a Pratt and Whitney, uh, turbine engine in it. That's uh, flat rated to 560 horsepower. And uh, some of the fuel systems and electrical systems that are in the main part of fuselage are modified, but the fuselage is virtually identical. Um, to talk about the uh, what I mentioned a minute ago, um, the conflicts with ATC. So because Marstown is located so close to Newark and it's under the class B or class Bravo airspace. Um, and the um, anything above 18,000 feet is considered positive control airspace. So when you're above 18,000 feet, you have to be on an IFR flight plan and be controlled by ATC. So if I'm coming back from Florida, for example, I may be at 27,000 feet, I'm cruising along and as far south as um, just halfway, like between Richmond and the North Carolina border, I usually start getting pushed down from 27,000 feet down lower. And uh, this, the reason for that is because of all of the commercial jet traffic going into the New York area, they don't want small planes that are slower crossing altitudes with commercial aircraft, which are a lot larger. So they start pushing the commercial aircraft going faster much further out than you would, then I need to start descending, but they don't want me to cross altitude. So they start pushing me down also. So a lot of times when I'm below 18,000 feet, if it's VFR, visual flight rules, 
I can cancel IFR and proceed to my to Morristown under visual flight rules at like 17,500 feet and still get reasonable efficiency out of the engine. Otherwise, uh, if it's IFR all the way into Morristown, I, 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 I got to follow the altitudes they are telling me to be at. And most of the time they have me down to 13,000 feet in Maryland and then sometimes down to 5,000 feet near Philadelphia and so on. So, um, it's a, it's a, um, it's a trade-off. Anyway, in conclusion, um, the pros of being based at Morristown, um, excellent runway, taxiway, and parking maintenance there. Um, like I said, they clean snow up pretty quickly. They maintain the runway in, in very good shape. They're constantly repairing it or repaving it. Uh, they've got good instrument approaches. They have an ILS or a GPS approach down to 200 feet to the main runway. Um, so uh, the weather's got to be really, really low for you to be able not to get in there. Uh, the control tower simplifies picking up clearances or canceling clearances. They'll cancel a clearance for you when you land. Uh, you can pick one up from them when you uh, are ready to depart. And they got reasonably long runways. So there's plenty of margin for uh, being a little off your game, so to speak. The cons these days are the lack of any maintenance facility. So I have to fly to Caldwell for any routine maintenance that I need to do on my airplane. Uh, the avgas is expensive. Um, I'm not flying a piston engine airplane anymore, but the avgas is, you know, seven to seven fifty eight dollars a gallon it varies a little bit with it's 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 expensive and you know my old airplane was burning 17 gallons an hour so right there you know you're 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 it's costing you just in fuel costs a uh, hundred ten hundred twenty dollars an hour the hangar space is still expensive um uh, they're located under the new york class bravo airspace which i just explained why it's uh it leads to some difficulties in uh, being able to uh, pick up flight plans because of traffic with Newark. And um, they're expensive and they cater, cater to corporate traffic. Uh, they don't they don't particularly like the smaller aircraft. They put up with us, but not uh, willingly. Anyway, uh, that's the end of that's that's all I've got for today. Uh, we'll take your questions. So our first question will be from Ron. Ron Weinger, please come up. Thank you. I, I have a couple of questions for sure. First one is you started out you started out with a high wing airplane right. and then went to low wing. Yeah. Is there any particular reason why the higher performance planes are low wing versus the high wing? Second question, uh with an automobile, after about 10 years, the manufacturer doesn't want to talk to you anymore about replacement parts, spares, whatever. Uh, but airplanes, do you have, is that the same kind of problems that you can't find things? Um, the other question, uh, oh, I can't think of Okay, there was one um, before COVID. I remember there was like an air event at Mars Town, and they had military planes come in, and they had you know, flight demonstrations. Yeah. How are those controlled as far as uh, being in a class B space? And uh, that should be enough for you, I think. I had okay. a fourth, but I can't remember. Yeah. Well, if you think of it, come back. Yeah. All right, if you think of it. Um, okay, so, um, you wait, your first question was, uh, uh, okay. So the thing I didn't like about a high wing, um, uh, there are some high performance, higher performance high wing airplanes, like Cessna makes a whole, line of them or they did the Cessna when I was buying the Saratoga I looked at a Cessna 210 which is a six seat high wing airplane with retractable gear but the one thing I didn't like is that when you were making turns if you were in an airport traffic pattern you're making turns uh to the airport the high wing airplane would block your view of where the airport is so you you would lose the view of the airport making a left a right turn or a left turn to line yourself up with uh, uh, the base and final onto the runway. So I kind of preferred because of that uh, the low wing airplanes. 
Okay. Um, next question. The maintenance. Um, Piper, it, it depends on the airplane. Um, Piper and Cessna, which are still making small general aviation airplanes, and a few other manufacturers, uh, Mooney, uh, Beach, uh, Beechcraft, um, they are still supporting pretty well all the older airplanes way out to whatever. Uh, some parts, um, some of the tooling for some of the planes had been destroyed for because of fire or something, you know, unforeseen. Um, at that point, you have to go to a junkyard, basically, for that that parts out wrecked airplanes. In some cases, you can get parts from them that are no longer available. In some in some cases, you have to have a custom part made, and that gets pretty expensive. But so far, you know, I haven't had that problem. Um, what was your third question? What? Oh, the the military aircraft they they're subject to the same uh, controls as any airplane at that airport. So if there's any military aircraft, they have to notify ATC that they will be in the airspace and so on, or and get the you know clearance from the tower to take off. And if they go into the class Bravo, if they they have to notify them. You know, they they all have to follow the same rules because they're not they're not stopping traffic for. Um, you know, commercial traffic. Sometimes in some air shows, they might put a TFR, temporary flight restriction, a small area, like a three nautical mile radius area around the airport, up to maybe 3000 feet. If you, I, I know like um, um, Green uh, Greenwood Lake Airport, they have an air show there every June. Um, they put a three mile, 3000 foot TFR around the airport uh, to, to uh, that, alerts pilots that there's an air show going on and to stay away from that area, but that's an uncontrolled airport. So, um, uh, ATC doesn't have control over that airspace outside that three mile ring. Okay. Yeah, this is Roger Burns. A uh, couple things. First of all, uh, two years ago, I was uh, program chairman for a month, and I tried to get Marshtown Airport to make a presentation. So thank you very much for coming. I never got an answer from the town. Um, but I have sort of a, a history of Marshtown. In 1958, I took flying lessons there at a place called Wings of Marshtown. It was uh, Cessna 150. Um, and uh, at the time, I had completed eight hours, and I was ready to solo. But I was told that at 20, uh, I sh should should be able to get the private's license. And you mentioned today 60 hours. And I, I gave up cause of what it cost. Right. And I'm sure it's a lot more today. But the other the other question I have, well, first of all, why is it longer today? And secondly, years later, I returned to Marstown Airport. I was employed by a company in Marstown, Crum and Forster, which uh, based their Falcon jet there. And I flew frequently on that. Uh, but on one morning, and I, since it's the same time of year right now, I want to ask you this. We aborted the takeoff twice because of deer on the runway. Oh, yeah. And I'm just curious whether that's still a problem today. You, okay. you can take it. Yeah. Um, yeah. The I, Unfortunately, some time ago, uh, Morristown had a dubious distinction of having the most deer aircraft strikes of any airport in the country. They they built a fence around the entire airport, uh, and they started culling the deer out. All right, uh, I've seen coyotes there too, uh, and I think they they didn't admit this, but I think that they actually um, put them there to keep the deer population from coming back. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so yeah, it's it, it had been a problem. A, a friend of mine, actually, the guy that actually ran the Bell Labs Adventure Flying Club, uh, it didn't happen to him at Morristown, it happened at Essex County Airport in Caldwell. He had a deer strike with his airplane, you know, it's 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 pretty expensive and a big mess, yeah, it's to fix, yeah, yeah. Um, Morristown has, and I got some of the inf historical information, they have a communications guy there that I contacted and he gave me some of the 
history of the airport. That's how I got it. Uh, maybe, you know, I, this, I know he's been there for about 10 years. So uh, I don't know if they had anybody before him uh, when you wanted to give a presentation, but that's how I got some of my info. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the FAA requires 40 hours to get your private pilot's license. You can do it at 16. Uh, everybody progresses at a different rate. And I wasn't, I wasn't that quick. I, it took me 60 hours of flight time before my instructor felt I was competent enough and signed me off to take my, uh, my exam with the flight, with a designated flight examiner. Yeah. It is pricey. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think, uh, there's a couple of clubs at Morristown and I looked into them and, you know, years ago uh before boarding buying an airplane i realized if i want to get an airplane for the weekend most of the people that are in clubs fly them like they take them for a few hours take a trip for their 200 hundred dollar hamburger you know <laughs> and and um i realized if i wanted to take some serious traveling uh i really needed my own airplane i think now like one of the main flying clubs there has like four cessna 172s i think they rent them wet means that includes fuel for about $150 an hour. Yeah, so it's not inexpensive. Yeah, Paul Tukey. Thank you so much for coming and giving this great talk. And it, and it's it's fun for those of us who aren't private pilots to get a glimpse at the lifestyle. And, you know, I, I know I've had some friends who are pilots and it's kind of an all-consuming thing. Because obviously, you're just into every aspect of it, but it also extends your region of you know places you can go just on a day because it's a nice day yeah. you know i mean it, it's a different way of viewing living in new jersey i think and it's fascinating so i i actually have several questions but i'm going to only ask one and get back on the queue in case there's time for another and it's this <laughs> i uh live in summit very close to short hills mall i often drive out route 24 and route 10 to Morristown and East Hanover. So, you know, I'm kind of in the region of the airport a lot. And every time I see police cars everywhere at every major intersection, dozens and dozens of them in the region, I know that Donald Trump is either, either leaving or arriving at his Bedminster, you know. So my question is, do all of Donald Trump's flights uh, uh, in and out and presumably Secret Service and every, his whole entourage, what impact does that have on the airport and, and on the people who use it? Well, um, okay. Uh, well, when he was president, um, yes, uh, he would fly in on uh, a smaller Bo uh, Air Force One. They, use a, they have a Boeing, they have several of Boeing 757s. I think there's two of them. They have two Boeing 747s, which are too large to land at Morristown, 6,000-foot runway. They have two 757s. And yes, they would close the airport um, uh, for about an hour and a half window before and after his arrival or departure. Um, and um, uh, they would block off all the roads, like you said, um, 24 ramps and, you know, 287 and, and Columbia Turnpike and whatnot. Um, and uh, then they would... Uh, have three helicopters there and he would board one of them. So it was a shell game. You didn't know which one he was on and take different flight paths to his golf club. All right. Now I haven't seen that happen since, uh, he'll, he left the presidency in 2021. So I, I, they're not closing the airport and I don't think, I don't know how he's getting to his golf club now, but I haven't seen that happen recently. Yes. Uh, Herb Waddell. Now from the sublime to the ridiculous, <laughs> I've rented a plane to fly in and out of the uh, primitive area of Idaho. Yeah. I have a good friend who's worked as an FAA inspector in Alaska certifying bush pilots, okay. and I personally flew on Navy aircraft, World War II vintage, okay. as crew. And uh, have you ever operated in 
in that fringe of the air uh, community. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, well, uh, actually, any of the recent airplanes I've owned, like the two PA 46s aren't even certified for non-paved runways. That's the first thing. Uh, but uh, uh, I know I've never operated as anything in a remote bush kind of air, country airstrip. Um, the closest I came, I think I rented back when I first got my private pilot's license, I flew into Cornell, New York, and I flew on a 182 into a grass air grass field. That's the closest I've ever come. Oh, in Alaska, of course, they often didn't even have grass. Well, my I understand from what I understand, in Alaska uh, people uh, use airplanes so much there to so many remote areas. Airplanes are allowed to actually taxi down roads with the cars, and they have the right of way over a car. <laughs> I enjoyed the talk very much. My name is Edward Ack, and my sister was a graduate of RPI in 1981. I don't know if you, that was your year. No, I was uh, graduated in 77. Okay. And I wonder how big of planes do the, can the airport accommodate today? Okay. Um, all right. Uh, the um, uh, that's that's a that's a um, Difficult question to answer because weather pair plays such a big role in it. Temperature, especially uh, with uh, jet aircraft, um, the higher the temperature, the higher the density altitude is, and the lower the performance of the engines are. So, um, so far, all of the corporate aircraft, the, even the big ones like a Gulfstream 650 or a Bombardier or Global Express, which are like 70,000 pound aircraft can take off and land there. Um, uh, and I've seen 727s and of course the, seven, the Air Force One, which is a 757 land and take off there. 757 is a 300,000 pound aircraft. So I, I know at least something that big, but um, again, it depends on uh, temperature and weight of the airplane. So if, if you're, if you, if you have an airplane where if you look at the pilot operating handbook and you look at the temperature and you look at your weight because of the amount of fuel you have and you say, oh, this is getting marginal, you have a couple of options. Uh, one is to wait till it gets cooler or B, you can offload some fuel and maybe have to make a stop that you didn't have to make a stop to your destination and lighten the plane enough so it could take off on the runway that's quoted in the airplane pilot's airplane uh, pilot's operating handbook. Uh, okay, more questions, uh, Paul? It, these are quick questions. Um, first of all, given the high cost of owning and maintaining and flying an airplane, uh, is it common at Morristown Airport for planes to be co-owned by two or several people? Question number one. The other question is uh, fuel economy. Now, if you just totally ignore the cost of maintenance and everything else and just think to yourself, what is the cost in terms of fuel to drive from here to Florida or to fly from here to Florida? Which wins? Oh, boy. Okay. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, uh, co-ownership is fairly popular. Um, so to mitigate costs, like I said, there's flying clubs. So, um, do you, I, I know like the, uh, Aero 150th flying club, uh, which is based at Morristown. Well, they have two airplanes at Morristown and two at Somerset. Um, they, uh, they're one of the most economical ways to get into flying, but coning an airplane is fairly common. Uh, I don't, I wouldn't say it's a majority, but it's probably, a significant minority of people that do that. Um, as as far as fuel costs go, um, now it, it depends on what you're flying and how fast you're going. Uh, the Piper Malibu I owned, uh, my third airplane, 
that was a very efficient airplane. Um, it, if you were up in the flight levels, which is 18,000 feet or higher, I would be burning 17 gallons an hour and going at a, about 200 to 210 knots, which is about 230 to 245 miles an hour. And I could make it down to Florida in like five hours. So I'd burn about 100 something gallons of fuel. Uh, and uh, I'm talking South Florida. Um, I, I normally fly down to Key Largo, Florida when I go down there. Um, so that plane is probably more efficient than let's say driving a, uh, a minivan or something, you know, or an SUV down to the same distance, traveling the same distance. But uh, Avgas, like I said, costs a lot more, almost twice as much in some, uh, in some cases as uh, gasoline for your car. So it, it's more expensive just in, from a fuel po cost point of view. There are no tolls in the air. That's, that's, that's true. That's true. But there's a lot of other tolls. Insurance, insurance now has become uh, one of the biggest uh, costs of owning an aircraft. Um, and, uh, and, and it's all based sort of like a bo a boat. You declare a hull value for the airplane and uh, the hull value is about 80% of your premium. Uh, John Tomaszewski. So I have a, I have a fun uh, one. Uh, you always see the movie where the pilot and the co-pilot and these huge jumbo jets uh, either get six or shot or something. And they always yell, anybody in the plane fly this thing. Are you, could you do that? Probably with a lot of help from somebody on the ground to tell me where everything is. Um, you know, it, just when I transitioned from the Malibu to the jet prop, even though, like I said, the airframe is the same, uh, the instrument panel is so different it would, different radios, different control locations, switches, and everything that it, it, it was a learning curve. It, it took me probably 50 hours before I, a flying time, before I felt. Uh, comfortable in it, you know, where I said, I kind of knew intuitively or instinctively where everything was located. So that's, it, it, so I, I, to answer your question shortly, no, I probably couldn't land one, but maybe with some good coaching from the ground, I could. Okay. Uh, DJ Perron. Thank you. Um, it reminds me of when I was a little kid. Uh, I took some flying lessons and I had to stop because I had a near miss. So um, I kind of regret not, not having continued in hearing your, your speech. The, uh, my question is about safety. And uh, I was wondering, um, you know, it, it, uh, you mentioned that uh, every, once a year you have to go to um, a, a course. Yeah. And, uh, but if you were going to stop flying, say for a month or you tell me how long uh how long would it take before uh before you feel you would not feel comfortable uh before you have you would have to take a refreshing course thank you uh one interruption that was our last question okay um uh, f fortunately i only had uh one instance where I um, stopped flying for about six months and I basically thought I would didn't feel comfortable and I basically went and took a recurrent training course like I did like I do every year all right to get my feel back um, the, a month I I think I feel okay um, but six months definitely not and wow. I never let that much time go by. I always, you know, fly, have somewhere to fly. I rarely fly. Uh, I really go flying just recre recreationally. Almost all my flights are to go somewhere that I need to go to or my family needs to go to. And uh, like next week, I my daughter's out in Minnesota. We're planning on going, flying out to Minnesota to, for Thanksgiving. And uh, so that's, when, you know, my next my next big trip. But uh, yeah, that's that's uh, it's something you really 
have to keep doing to stay competent. And um, and so uh, I fly at least a couple of times a month. Well, flying is really cool. This is amazing. Um, Mano, please come up and thank our wonderful speaker. Well, Greg, I think uh, all of us in this room right now would say that this was a very interesting uh, presentation, a lot of stuff that none of us, other than sitting in a plane, have the option to do. So thank you very much. And to kind of, uh, oh, I guess you can put this in your living room or whatever <laughs> room you'd like to put it into. Okay. This is from the Summit Old Guard. It's a certificate of uh, appreciation. Uh, and... Um, there's an orchid on there, and the reason it has an orchid as a picture here is because 1930, when this uh, old guard was uh, uh, developed or started, uh, then it was, uh, uh, Summit was the or orchid capital of New Jersey, and a lot of orchids were sold here and sold all over the country and more and so on. So with that, we'd like to give you this and then the, the old summit card uh, well thank you very much <laughs>